Uh, I think Cheryl should be in the back room and ready to go with the first talk. Tom, is that correct? Cheryl, welcome. Hello, Mark. Hello, David. How's it going? Very well. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Excited by this. It seems odd to be talking to you virtually on a camera when I think we're less than a mile apart physically right now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll hop over to your place after this. We can, get we can do the second half from my house. I'll get the barbecue going. Okay, good. So <laughs> we're kicking off every talk with um, a quick random question. So you spend your days working in virtual ecosystems uh, by necessity. What's the place you're most looking forward to visiting physically after all these uh, shenanigans are over? Huh. Um, <laughs> before, so one year ago before the pandemic, uh, I think I said I wanted to go to Bali and I think that's still pretty high up on my list. All right, solid choice. So without further ado, Cheryl's gonna be giving us her 10 predictions for cloud native in 2021. Cheryl, are you ready? I am ready. Let me Take just share away. my screen. Alrighty, so here we go. I'm going to do 10 predictions for cloud native in 2021 in 25 minutes. So this is going to be a pretty quick fire overview of some topics that I've seen and I think are interesting uh, that perhaps you should keep an eye out on if you're interested in cloud native. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Cheryl Hung. I'm the VP of Ecosystem at CNCF. You can find me on Twitter at Oi Cheryl or at my blog, oisheryl.com. And just to set the stage in a bit of context, first of all, Cloud Native is still accelerating. I'm going to show you a few different graphs and charts to kind of persuade you that this is the case. This is a report from Flexera at the end of 2020. And they asked people whether they were planning to use more or less cloud due to COVID-19. COVID-19, like everything, has, has accelerated all trends, including cloud native. And you can see that of the responses, 57% of people said that they planned to increase the amount of cloud that they were using from what they'd originally intended to use. The jobs market for Kubernetes is still very, very hot. It's continuing to grow. And in the last open source jobs report from the Linux Foundation, 69% of hiring managers said that they are seeking cloud and container expertise. Uh, this is a photo from my very first KubeCon back in Berlin in 2017. And you can see here that in 2017, there were seven projects within CNCF. Today, there are, I believe, 89 at the last count. And something like 35 or 40 of these were accepted in the last year. So it's, it's still accelerating. It's still getting moving crazy fast. And of course, this is reflected in the size of the community. So we're now at 123.6 thousand contributors from all over the world. And collectively, they've made more than nearly 6 million contributions. So contributions are code commits, issues, pull requests. Um, yeah. And you can see these stats at devstats.cncf.io. Just a couple more slides. So one is the CNCF annual survey. Um, this question was, do you run containers in production? You can see that the very first time that we asked this question in 2016, only 23% of people said yes. Today, or in 2020, it's 92%. And basically, the upshot of all of this is that the biggest challenge in today using containers in Kubernetes is just complexity. It's just there's so many moving pieces, things move so fast, things change all the time, that it's really hard to get a really clear view of what is reality, what is hype, what's coming up next, um, and what you really need to keep an eye out on. So within CNCF, I lead the CNCF end user community. This is a group of more than 140 organizations who are using Kubernetes and other cloud native projects 
in production. Um, and I talk to most of these companies pretty frequently. So I get quite an interesting view on how hundreds of different environments work, all the different problems that people are coming up with. And this is where my 10 predictions mostly come from. But these are just the people that I've spoken to. So I would love to hear from you if you have different predictions, if you disagree with any of my predictions, um, or if you think there are things that are missing that are that should be in here. Again, just to reiterate, cloud native deployments are getting more complex. And I have a little fun video for you just to show you something that a few years ago would have been pretty crazy, but I think now is actually happening. So I believe that Tom is going to switch over to the video for this. Let me just pause this a moment. See if Tom can. Oh, Tom says it's not working. OK, bummer. Sorry about that. Um, basically, to give you a quick um, overview, this video was from the US Department of Defense, the Air Force, and they are deploying Kubernetes on fighter jets and Istio on fighter jets as well. They've gone from running Ada to running Go. so. A, jump of you know 50 years or something like that. And this is the sort of use case now that is really pushing the limit of what cloud native is and what is expected from cloud native deployments. I'm going to come back to my slides and keep going. This is on YouTube, by the way. This is super fun. So if you search for like CNCF end user Department of Defense, then this video is actually really really worth watching. OK, so that's the context. Context is cloud native is still moving super, super fast. Things are getting more complicated. And the question that I hear a lot from people is, what's coming next? What should we be looking out for? And I'm going to give you 10 predictions now. And these 10 predictions are in three different categories. So the first category is tech broadly. So things like tooling, languages, frameworks, uh, things to do with the CNCF projects. The second category of predictions is going to be DevOps, by which I mean people, processes, um, things that happen across teams within an organization. And then the third category of predictions is going to fall into ecosystem. And by this, I mean broader things that are happening across organizations and across the industry. And once again, these are my 10 predictions. And I would love to hear from you whether you agree with these, whether you think that some of these uh, are just hype and not real, or whether there are things that you think that I've missed that other people should know about. So the first prediction is more Rust in cloud native projects. So Rust is a fairly still new and up and coming language. Uh, this is the Red Monk survey that they did in the last in the third quarter of 2020, and it's just the popularity rank on GitHub and Stack Overflow. So Rust is kind of up and coming, I would say a little bit. It's still kind of, it, it's not the sort of like Go and Java and C++ ones that are further up here. So what we're seeing within CNCF is that more and more projects are being written in Rust. Today, there are 75 repositories from the same devstats.cncf.io website, but more and more are coming in, and we're thinking this is probably going to increase in the future. The second prediction is that cross-cloud becomes more real. And I know that Mark was mentioning hybrid cloud a little bit earlier, so I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, my take on this is that, uh, well, so first of all, let's talk about cloud, hybrid cloud, and multi-cloud. So cloud is mainly either public cloud or on-prem. Hybrid cloud is the ability to span the two. 
And multi-cloud is the ability to just run, sort of take all your, your infrastructure and move it kind of indiscriminately from one cloud to another. And the reason I put that it becomes more real rather than it just becomes real is because I think the biggest challenge in this is still the data management and the storage layer. So moving compute, moving applications across on-prem and public cloud or across different public cloud providers, today you could argue is feasible. I think moving storage is still a chat, moving data is still a challenge. And there are a few different vendors and co coming out with products to help with this, but I think we're not quite there yet on the, the storage side. So I'm particularly interested in whether it's going to be possible to move stateful applications across clouds as opposed to stateless applications. My third prediction is WebAssembly and eBPF. These are two very different technologies. The only reason that I put them both into the same one is because we're starting to see more and more CNCF projects that are using the capabilities that these projects afford to enable new ways and new places to run containers and run Kubernetes. And one of those is Edge, which again um, is very applicable to today's conference. So when we're talking about Edge, we're talking about the distance from the user, basically. So at the closest to the user, zero to 25 kilometers, you have things like phones and smart devices. A little bit further away, you have regional Edge and access Edge. And then today, and the furthest away, is the centralized data centers that we pretty much have nowadays. And there's more and more interest in moving compute towards the user because this provides for a better user experience and enables you to do things that you can't do purely within the cloud, the traditional cloud data centers. But it comes with a whole host of problems and some of these problems are you have reduced control over the devices that your containers are running on. Your resources are constrained. You don't have unlimited or seemingly unlimited compute and network. Your network is un unreliable. So you might have limited connectivity. You might have delays and disconnections. And you're, you don't have as much control. So your devices are potentially insecure. But having said that, I think that, that this is definitely something that the telecom industry has a lot of interest in. And so I think this is something that we're starting to see a lot of really good movement on. And the moving on to um, moving from tech to the DevOps kind of predictions now, my next prediction is for GitOps. So GitOps is a paradigm where you declare your entire infrastructure declaratively and then within Git and then rely on software agents to update from your Git repositories to the live running systems. This actually combines really nicely with Kubernetes on the edge because you can do things like um, have your deploy containers to all of your devices at the edge just by using something like um, Argo CD to manage the images versus what's running on the, on the devices. So this has really started to take off and there is a working group around it called the GitOps Working Group. So if you are interested in learning more about GitOps, about understanding what are the benefits of it, then I would recommend you join this working group to hear a little bit more about it. My number six prediction is chaos engineering. So chaos engineering has been around for a while. The best practices came out from Netflix, you know, probably a decade ago at this point around chaos monkey. Um, chaos engineering is a little bit like vaccines. 
you inject a little bit of harm into your running systems and that makes the overall infrastructure stronger. So you might inject, say, you want 50% of your requests to fail or you want 50% of your requests to go more slowly than expected. And that way you find out what are the effects of this on your services and what do you need to fix. There's a couple of projects within CNCF, like Chaos Mesh, that are up and coming and supporting this paradigm of chaos engineering. I haven't seen massive widespread deploy deployments of this yet, but I think this is a really, really great idea. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing this one grow a little bit more. Number seven, the rise of FinOps. So FinOps stands for financial operations. It's basically managing cloud costs and figuring out how to optimize your cloud spending. And if you, this is from the same report as the one that we talked about earlier, it's from Flexera. And when they asked the respondents, what are your top cloud initiatives for 2020? The number one one was to optimize the existing use of cloud and find some cost savings. And a little bit further down, we also have better financial reporting on cloud costs. So I think this is interesting because I think pretty much every company that is running on public cloud at some point will get to this stage of needing to understand and needing to manage their costs more effectively. And CNCF has a sister foundation within the Linux Foundation called FinOps Foundation. And this is a foundation which is led by practitioners at the moment, mostly by practitioners. And this is people who are trying to solve this problem and figure out what these best practices are right now. So if you are interested in FinOps, then just look up FinOps Foundation and meet the rest of the community and find out what they're doing. Number eight, and now we're switching into the ecosystem, uh, ecosystem predictions. So number eight is pluggable developer and operator experience. And what do I mean by this? So one of the criticisms of Kubernetes, very rightfully, is that it's it has a very, very steep learning curve. You have to spend a lot of time understanding concepts before you can actually start using it. And actually, back when I was an engineer at Google, we used to have this same problem with Borg, that it would take people six months to onboard to really understand what Borg, how to use Borg effectively. So Backstage is an open source project, a CNTF project that came out of Spotify. And it is a dashboard which is intended to be used by developers and operators. And it's based on a plugin architecture which means that different vendors can add in different, different vendors or open source project maintainers can add in different parts and plug into this one single dashboard. So I think this is actually a much nicer experience than you know, using raw kubectl or using whatever wrapper you've built on top of that. And I think that this is something that will make it a lot easier for people to get started on the kind of Kubernetes world and the world of containers. Number nine, service mesh consolidation. Service mesh has been a hot topic for a couple of years now. And one of the side effects of that is that we have quite a few different projects within service mesh. And I'm predicting that this year, these kind of settle and we get fewer um, sort of more effort behind a fewer number of service mesh projects. Which ones those are, I don't want to speculate about now. Um, but I feel like we're kind of at that tipping stage when it comes to service mesh. And I put this diagram in here just because I really like it. This is the Monzo uh, application graph and the different, sorry, I think this is the pods. Each one of these represents uh, either pods or services and the different communications that happen in between of that, in between each of those. And the last one, number 10, end user driven open source. 
So obviously I work with end users a lot and with the end user community, what we're trying to do is to make sure that the voice of the voice of the end user is effectively amplified and it helps with it helps kind of bring the reality of what open source of what cloud native really is, what it really means. And for that feedback to go back into the projects and to make it better. One of the initiatives that we started around this is the technology radar, the end user technology radar. This is where we survey the end user community once a quarter on different topics. And we file the different kinds of projects that they, the different answers um, about what they're using to solve those problems into a radar where we say, you know, some things are fairly mature, they're placed in adopt, and then some things are trial, so they're a little bit perhaps newer or perhaps not so widely used, and assess the things that are perhaps not used, so are, are kind of up and coming or perhaps they're on their way out as well. So I would recommend that you go to radar.cncf.io and read the last couple of reports in this. Okay, that was a very, very lightning fast summary. So let's just review what we talked about. Number one, cloud native deployments are getting more and more complex. People are expecting more and more out of their infrastructure. So the best way to stay on top of what's coming next is to get involved with the community and find out what's happening from other people. Here's a rundown of those 10 predictions for cloud native in 2021. So in tech, we had more rust in cloud native. Cross cloud becomes more real. WebAssembly and eBPF are, create, are enabling new modes, new places where we can run containers, including Kubernetes on the edge. Uh, within the DevOps predictions, GitOps is growing significantly as is chaos engineering practices. And FinOps is a concern for a lot of different companies who are using public cloud. Um, and this is something that, again, is kind of up and coming, but I think it's very, very interesting. And then ecosystem predictions, pluggable developer and operator experiences to make it easier and help people on board faster. The number of service meshes is probably going to consolidate behind a few, a few projects. And then end users are going to become a much more prominent part of the community. And I'm just going to highlight two of these a little bit more that CNCF is putting some effort behind. One is the Kubernetes on the edge. So if you're interested in cloud native telcos, 5G and edge, then there are a couple of different working groups that will be interesting to you. One is the Cloud Native Networking Functions Working Group. So the goal of this group is to figure out what Cloud Native means for telco workloads. And then another one is the Kubernetes IoT Edge Working Group. We also have a survey open at the moment, which you can complete, where we're trying to find out a little bit more about how people are running Kubernetes on the edge. And then the second part is the technology radar, which I mentioned at the very end. So if you go to radar.cncf.io, you can read the past reports. So the most recent one in February 2021 was on secrets management. The one before that was on database storage, observability, and continuous delivery. So I do recommend that you go take a look at that. And if you are an end user yourself, as in you work for a company that is not selling cloud native products or services, but you're using them, then I recommend you join the CNCF end user community where you can get access to the data and to the companies behind these reports. Um, and you can contribute to them yourself as well and help other people within the community. So for that, you can go to cncf.io slash end user. And that is it. That was a very, very quick tour across my 10 predictions for cloud native. Um, I believe we may have a minute or two left for questions. Hello, Cheryl, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, the questions are being streamed in from 
many, many, many conduits. Uh, <clears throat> Tom, do we have any that you'd like to bring up? Because I've got one of my own, if not. The man behind the curtain. Okay, moving on. So my <laughs> question, Cheryl, is about the technology radar. I believe this was inspired by the ThoughtWorks technology radar. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the background there and how it's grown over time. Sure. So the, the, the whole idea behind a technology radar is to kind of reveal the landscape around new and upcoming projects. So uh, kind of emerging landscape. And the ThoughtWorks radar is sort of 10 plus years old at the moment by now, and they do a once a year, hundreds of different topics across all kinds of areas of technology. So I kind of borrowed this format and made it more frequent and shorter with the goal to reveal not just what one company, in this case, ThoughtWorks uses, but what a whole community thinks about particular topics. So by creating, you know, we, we do a survey on, for the end user community. We recruit a team of volunteers each time so that they are really the voice of the community and they're the ones who decide what ends up on these final radars and what are the themes and the predictions that they saw. So yeah, it's actually been incredibly successful so far. I've had companies tell me like, hey, we try and we present this internally when we look at choosing a, t uh, choosing a technology. Um, I've had meetups say like we schedule a meetup every single time that one of these comes out so that we can compare what we do to what the end user community does. Nice. Um, so yeah, it's been great. It's been a really, uh, really well received. And uh, for anyone else who's interested, could you just repeat the URL again for that? It's radar.cncf.io, I believe. Exactly. Yeah, radar.cncf.io. <laughs> Fantastic. David, anything from you? I don't think I've ever nodded in agreement so much through a talk than that one. There. <laughs> I, I think all of the things you were listening are exactly what I'm hoping to see come from the future of this ecosystem as well. I'll just highlight two that really resonated with me. One is Rust. I think my team are so fed up with me asking to rewrite everything in Rust, but it's just one of those languages so enjoyable to work with, plus we get all the safety guarantees. I think it will play a huge part in the cloud native ecosystem. And the other one was, was WebAssembly. I think uh, Solomon Hikes, the founder of Docker, actually tweeted, I don't know if it was this year or last year, that he wouldn't have built Docker if WebAssembly had existed in 2013. And I think that's a testament to the power of where WebAssembly is going, and particularly the WASI subgroup who are trying to run WebAssembly on bare metal. Very exciting mm -hmm. technologies indeed. Uh, we've got a question that's come in. Now, having been a little bit inside the CNCF, I realize this is a bit of a curveball, but I'm going to ask it as it's written. So um, there are a lot of projects in the CNCF, some of which seem to do similar things. Is there any plan for consolidation of the projects? So CNCF, uh, from the beginning, has always said, we don't play kingmaker. We don't choose which projects will win over another. Um, we're very happy to welcome in multiple projects doing similar things. And then whichever one gets the most adoption and the most contributors and community around it will naturally succeed by itself. So no, we don't plan to do any intentional consolidation. There we go. The, in, the <laughs> invisible Darwinian hand of cloud native. Um, I don't see any more questions coming through. So I think it might be time to say goodbye, Cheryl, and welcome our next speakers. But before I do that, Cheryl, thank you so much. That was an amazing way to kick off Giphy Day. And we're really appreciative for you making time during what must be a little bit mental right now. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm very great, grateful to be here. So Mark, David, thank you so much. And everybody else, enjoy the rest of today. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Bye-bye.